I also have a patient who uh, I think really exhibited that implicit memory. And this was a woman who was involved in a severe car accident and she was amnestic for the car accident. But she had been told, you know, about the car accident, so she was able to tell me about it from what she had been told. And what had happened after she'd been involved in the car accident is that she was flown to a nearby hospital by helicopter and then was treated. Mm -hmm. And was she knocked out? Is yes, that why so, she didn't remember? Yeah. Loss of consciousness mm -hmm. for quite a period of time, was amnestic for the entire car accident and also uh, several days following the accident. So really a severe accident. And she had manifestations of post-traumatic stress. So she had uh, hyperarousal symptoms, she had avoidance, uh, she had difficulty driving, uh, didn't drive on highways anymore, and she had a lot of physiological and psychological arousal when she was faced with unsafe drivers or when she saw accidents on the highway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what was fascinating, when I interviewed her for the assessment, and she was telling me about this accident, I had an office on the 10th floor, and the helicopter pad was just outside the office. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing the assessment, even though she had no explicit memory of the accident, a helicopter came and landed next to the hospital. And as soon as she heard the helicopter, she started shaking and started having mm -hmm. all this anxiety. And that really taught me, wow, we really have to think about memory in different components, right? There's an explicit memory mm -hmm. for that we know about, for which we have words, but then there are these implicit memory systems that we know very little bit about, and we really need to learn more about. Yeah. And everybody has them. I think so. Yes, uh, everyone absolutely. has them, and, and uh, that's what I'm assuming, right? But that, that people with early childhood trauma have them by nature, almost by the nature of the earliness of the experience in the development of the brain. Yeah, when language is not language is yet. not right. It's not relevant to the experience. I mean, it's not on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think we really need to think about that as a field. Yeah. And really, you know, think about that whenever we talk about memory, but also when we study memory. Right. Yeah. 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 What I wanted to, to get you to, or ask you to talk about some, and uh, and I will try to fill in my part of it, is how the other major networks, and I know there are a lot in the brain, but the ones that are now being looked at, right, are the default mode network, the salience network, and the executive mm -hmm. network. Can you talk about how, what you see in those you see anything like what you see in the default mode network? What's, what's the story there? And so I think that's a really important question, also a really important point to know that, of course, the default mode network is only one brain network, right? And that there's many, many brain networks, but we'll focus on those three today. So that the default mode network, that's most connected at rest. And that's that network that helps us to uh, off task is what you mean off by off task at yeah rest. Okay. so when our brain is in neutral like like our car right mm -hmm. so when we're just you know sitting here self reflecting and that's the network we propose to model the sense of self in post traumatic stress and we talked about how uh, altered its connectivity is both at rest but also when an individual is faced with threatful stimuli mhm mm and then there's the salience network, and that network really helps us to know what's most salient, both in the environment, in the external environment, but also in the internal environment. So it guides us to, yeah, the thing that's most important, most salient, which then helps us to organize, you know, responses to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which is also critical, but also when we think about our traumatized individuals, we know already that this is very affected, right? Because salience is often ascribed to things that wouldn't be salient to a non-traumatized individual. For example, if you were assaulted in the forest in the past, you know, the rustling of the leaves in the forest may be very salient to you because that 
connects to that memory of having been assaulted in the forest. Mm -hmm. Whereas to somebody who hasn't had that experience, that wouldn't be seen. It's background. Right? Yeah, right. it's just background. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that network is very much affected uh, by trauma. And uh, I think, you know, it, the insula is a, a very important part of that network. So is the anterior cingular cortex. And, you know, the insula, I think, can uh, really lead to a dysfunction in a couple of ways. We can have too much connectivity or too much activation of the insula, which is often associated with hyperarousal, right? And, yeah, having too much of that visceral, visceral arousal. But when somebody is very disconnected from their feelings, that can also be decreased. And, you know, I think we often find that in people who are very dissociated, that the fear goes, right? And so if they're in a fearful situation, they're no longer connected with that fear, which is actually dangerous, yeah, right? right? Because if you're no longer connected with that fear. Risk. Yeah. Right. And I think often when you talk to survivors of domestic violence, they're disconnected from that fear. And I think that allows them to remain in that relationship. And what you see in treatment, and what I think is real progress in treatment, is once they start reconnecting with that sense of fear, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. then they can know and feel, you know, that they need to be afraid here. And so, yeah, as we're talking, it's clear how effective the salience network obviously is in trauma. And then there's the central executive network, so that's involved in planning and thinking and we know and attention and we know how traumatized individuals struggle with these functions, right? Concentration, you know, maintaining attention and focus, mm -hmm. short-term memory, right, is severely affected mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in the aftermath of trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think that often keeps people from returning to work, right? because they can't engage in these functions. And, you know, we've learned that dissociation and cognitive functioning are very much related as well. And the more dissociation you have, the more impaired your cognitive functioning is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which again, I think, if you think about it clinically, you know, if you're not there, it's very hard to focus, right? And it's very hard to take in information. And it always brings me back to uh, DBT groups, so dialectical behavior therapy groups I was running years ago. And we had a lot of very highly dissociative uh, patients in those groups. And they simply weren't present the first six months of the group. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't take anything in. Mm, right. All they learned for the first six months, and these were some of the highest users of the mental health care system, all they learned in the first six months of the group was how to be present. And then it was amazing to see them in the second six month segment of the group. Now that they had learned to be present, they were now able to start taking in information. How would they learn that, Ruth? So we taught them basic grounding strategies. So, you know, using the five uh, senses, mm -hmm. you know, how to become aware of what you see, what you hear, what you feel, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, what you mm -hmm. taste, right. so what the basic you smell. DBT stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also starting to ground them in their body, right? Mm -hmm. So also starting to do body scans. And yeah, and then in the second six months, month part of the group, they start to be able to take in the information which really uh, mirrors what we find in the research. The more dissociated you are, the more cognitive dysfunction you have. And actually now in collaboration with Margaret McKinnon at McMaster University, we're developing a treatment, again, an adjunctive treatment uh, to really focus on the attentional working memory and cognitive deficits in people with post-traumatic stress. And we're finding it that it decreases dissociative symptoms and it really helps people to be in the here and now and really engage, you know, that attentional system and that planning system and to improve their working memory, their short-term memory.